Amen. So the title of the sermon this evening is Free in Christ. Free in Christ, of course, you know, this is the 4th of July, and we're celebrating uh, you know, our freedom today that we've had that was won for us, uh, you know, the Day of Independence. And, uh, you know, I don't want to really focus in on that. <clears throat> you know, I really don't have a problem with any of that, people that want to celebrate that. Um, you know, that's, that's their deal. They go ahead and do that. Um, you know, I understand that we have a, a history in this country of, you know, of people having fought for our rights, and I don't think those are things we should take for granted. I think it's good to acknowledge the fact that, you know, there were, there were people that stood uh, for, you know, freedom and all of that. But at the same time, you know, what does that all, co- what does it come to mean today? You know, rather than looking back and just trying to be nostalgic about the past, what we should really do is think about, you know, where we are today as a nation, you know, and quite frankly, what the nation stands for today is not really anything that I care to get behind. You know, it's not something I care to celebrate. So I'm never going to fly the flag up here. I'm not going to get, I don't get real nostalgic about what this country has become. And, you know, but having said that, we also don't want to develop this attitude where we take for granted what we do have. You know, no doubt about it. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of liberties. We have a lot of freedoms here that a lot of other people don't have, you know, and, and we tend to take those things for granted. You know, when, when we've grown up with these things, we've grown up. Uh, with the freedom to just, you know, just, th- just think of the freedom to travel. You know, the fact that we can just, you know, go from one state to the next without having to, you know, pass some border. And, you know, well, there are some borders around here, right? Uh, you know, except for that one that's over there by California, you know, the, the Border Patrol, which is nowhere near an international border, by the way. But, you know, by and large, you can travel from one end of this country to the other without ever having to stop from state to state. Now, that's not the case in a lot of places. You know, go to these other, other European air countries and things like that. You have to stop, prove where you are, so on and so forth. You know, all the different freedoms that we have. You know, we still have, t- uh, to a large degree, the freedom of speech. You know, despite the fact that large corporations like YouTube and Facebook and so on and so forth are shutting us down, you know, or silencing the message or trying to, you know, <coughs> uh, um, uh, you know have, a, have a cancel culture, you know, where they're trying to get rid of us and quiet us and only have one side of view be allowed, you know, we still have the ability to gather here publicly and to preach. You know, this is something they can't take away. You know, they might kick us off Facebook. They might kick us off YouTube, but they're never going to stop the preaching the word of God in the church house. You know, we still have that freedom. But you know what? Some places they don't have this freedom. Uh, you know, the freedom to, to just gather together openly and freely. And, you know, we don't want to take those things for granted. You know, I, I don't want to become a, such a cynic about, you know, the forefathers and everything like that. And people want to argue you know, are they godly men or are they, you know, what they seem to be, you know, rationalists of their time who were deists, you know, and denied a lot of, you know, uh, the things of, uh, of, you know, the virgin birth and so on. So like Jefferson rewrote his own Bible. I mean, we could, uh, we could go on and on about that and have that debate, but does that really have any bearing on where we are today as a country? You know, and what I want us to kind of think about is the fact that, you know, we have these freedoms now. And there's been times in the past where not everybody's had these freedoms. And there's even places today where people don't have the freedoms that we have. And there's going to become a time in the future when we don't have the freedoms that we have. You know, we're, they're go- they are going to try and crack down. They are going to begin to tighten the noose. I mean, look at the things that are going on in Canada. They got, you know, preachers getting locked up. It's hate speech to turn to certain passages in the Word of God to even mention them from the pulpit. You go to jail for it in Canada. Okay? So that's, that's where we're headed you know, but whether we, uh, at any, you know, here's, a, here's what I want to get across is that at any time, no matter what our standing is in the world, no matter whether or not we have civil liberties uh, granted to us by our government, we are always free in Christ. Amen. They can never take that away. You know, and um, just like we have a tendency sometimes to take our, you know, our civil liberties for granted, you know, we should never, you know, we, we could do that about our spiritual liberty. You know, we could take for granted the fact that we are free in Christ and that we're, we, cannot, we don't have to be brought again under the yoke of bondage and that nobody can take that freedom away from us. <laughs> and here, you know, I just kind of want to instill that again in us tonight. This isn't going to be anything new. This is going to be anything, you know, that you haven't heard before. But these are things that we need to be reminded of, you know, to invigorate us and to remind us that we have a freedom in Christ which cannot be taken away by the world. And if we're not careful, we could take that for granted. And one big, you know, one thing that helps us to remember that, or appreciate rather, our f- the spiritual liberty that we have, is when we consider the fact that we were at one time in bondage. You know, we, you know, in the last few generations, perhaps don't take our our civil liberties, uh, 
you know, it, it, we take them for granted perhaps because, you know, we weren't the ones that fought for them. You know, we weren't the ones that had to sacrifice and give. You know, they were, we just kind of inherited it. You know, and if we don't stop and appreciate the fact that, you know, uh, those were fought for or that there was a group of people that were in bondage or were threatened to have those liberties taken away, you know, uh, we might take it for granted. You know, the people that fought for it, that, that freedom, they didn't take it for granted. You know, they did not take the liberty that they had for granted. Why? Because they were the ones that sacrificed, they're the ones that fought, and all that. So I want to remind us again, you know, what's going to help us appreciate the freedom that we have in Christ is if we remind ourselves that we were all at one time in bondage. Every one of us were in bondage, okay, spiritually speaking. And that might prevent us from taking things for granted. You're there in Galatians chapter 4. I'll read to you from Hebrews chapter 2. Okay, read, listen to me as I read from Hebrews 2. It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, speaking of Christ, himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy them that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them. Now who's the them there? That's me and you. Deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime, what? Subject to bondage. You know, death had us in bondage our entire life. You know, and of course, we know one day we're going to die, but you know what? The fear of death is taken away. The sting of death is taken away. The, 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 the victory of the grave is taken away in Christ. You know, we're going to die one day, but we can go to that death without fear. Now, of course, I'm sure that we're all going to experience that natural, you know, fear of death when that time comes, you know, the, the unknown. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe we'll go with complete peace. I can't imagine that, you know, I don't know what it's like. I've never done it. <laughs> but, you know... We're not, gonna, we're not living in dread and fear every day of the fact that one day we are going to die. Okay? I'm not saying we're just going to go bravely to our deathbeds and, and just have complete peace all the way through. Maybe we will. But there's people that are, that are you know, decades away from a deathbed that are afraid of dying every single day. And that has been taken away from us. And we might end up taking that for granted if we don't remember the fact that you know, we were in bondage. You know, we get saved. We've been saved for a long time. We have eternal life. We know we can't lose that. Sometimes we might get a, a little, you know, uh, we might, we might uh, forget the fact that, you know, we were on our way to hell. We were on our way to hell. We were in bondage. You know, and that should, you know, something I want to remind us of so that we don't take the freedom that we have in Christ for granted. Look, the world can take away our freedoms. The governments can lock down. They can take away things. They can shut us down. They can deplatform us. They can do all these things, but they cannot take away the freedom that is in Christ. And we should learn to appreciate that. We'll appreciate it more when we understand that we were all in bondage. It says there in, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 1, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. What is he saying? He's saying, look, the heir, the prince, the one who's going to inherit the throne, he's no different than a servant, as long as he is a child. He's on that same level. Why? He, because he is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we... When we were children, you know, before the time of what was tended to us by the Father to inherit, to become heirs, we were just servants. Even we, when we were children, were what? In bondage under the elements of the world. Look, we were in bondage. And Paul's including himself in that. He's speaking to the Galatians. He's speaking to, you know, the Gentiles, himself being a Jew. And he's saying we were in bondage, meaning we were all in bondage. There's no exceptions here. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were what? Under the law. So we were in bondage under the elements of the world. We were in bondage we were, when we were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of, uh, of sons. You know, before you got saved, you were in bondage. You were spiritually shackled and bound and on your way to hell. Every single one of us, self-included. And we should never lose sight of that. We should always remember that. You know, and that's kind of what's going on today. You know, people are remembering, you know, the, 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 you know, the Independence Day. They're remembering 1776, all of that. But, you know, I want to remind us today of our spiritual liberation. The day we were made spiritually independent from the bondage of death and the law and the elements of the world. Because all that they can take away. If there's anything we learned this last year is that when, when something goes wrong, the government has the power to start shutting things down, telling people to stay home and everything else. 
right? And we can debate about that whole narrative or not. You know, <laughs> it happened. I don't see what the point is about dating about it. <coughs> but they can't take away the, the freedom that's in Christ. To redeem them that were under the law, that you might receive the adoption of cuz. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. That's who we are. We went from being a servant to what? To being an heir. To being a son. To being a child of God through Christ. That was the spiritual liberation that came to us when we got saved. We, we'll take that for granted if we don't understand, if we forget that we were in bondage. There was a time when we were on our way to hell. Okay? And there's no exceptions. Everybody. You know, this, we, understand, we know the scriptures that all of sin and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, if you want to keep something, go over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, it says in Romans 5, Whereas for by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You know, the world's getting real excited today about, you know, their, 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 this nation's independence. You know, and I don't even know if a lot of them are. A lot of them are just getting excited about the fact that they got tomorrow off and they can get blind drunk tonight. That's what they're getting excited about. They're just going to eat and drink and, you know, blow a bunch of stuff up. Which, you know, I'm for all about blowing up some fireworks, you know. We'll do that too. We'll join in, right? But are they, are they you think a lot of people today are celebrating getting excited about, you know, our independence about the, the, the battles that were fought for our independence? Probably not. I mean, sure, there's probably people out there that understand it and know the history and appreciate it and everything like that. <coughs> but I want us to get excited about the fact that we have been spiritually, li spiritually liberated, okay? And here's the thing. Everyone's getting excited about that. Everyone, you know, but a lot of people are still, even these people that are celebrating that, they don't understand that they are in bondage. They're, they're, they're in a lot worse bondage than, you know, some tax, being, having to pay some tax. You know, or having some soldiers quartered in their home. You know, those were egregious things. You know, we're still, by the way, we're still paying the taxes. <laughs> you know, they got all upset about, you know, the things that, you know, Britain was doing to them and, and, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but here we are today, maybe free from all those things, but in a lot still a, no better off spiritually. Yeah, they might have thrown off the shackles of imperialism and all that, but they're still shackled by sin. They're still bound. And you know what? We here tonight who are saved are not. We're free. We have a freedom that they can't even imagine. And if they took all these other freedoms away, we'd still have that. They can't touch it. But everyone, no matter what nation you're from, you know, nationality makes no different difference. You know, people today, they, you know, they think, well, of course I'm Christian. I'm American. <laughs> well, what religion are you? Well, I'm in America, so clearly I'm a Christian. Right? And people think like this. You know, and people think this is a Christian nation that we're living in today. It's not. It, you know, whatever you want to talk about what it was at one time, you know, that we can have that discussion. But about what it is today, there's no denying it. Not a Christian nation is not supporting Christian values. It's chased God out of every public square. The Bible is not a welcome. The Ten Commandments are not welcome. It's promoting you know, sodomy to the world. It's promoting every kind of vile, filth, and wicked sin that there is to the entire world. That's what we're known for in the world. It's promoting you know, filth. Okay, So <clears throat> nationality makes no difference. And the Bible says that the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. Oh, except for America. Because America is so great. Right? No, it says all nations. You know, all nations are less than nothing before God, the Bible says. <coughs> there are no exceptions to that. It doesn't matter what country you live in. It doesn't matter, you know, uh, what you understand about politics or any of that. You, know, you are in bondage. We all were in bondage until we got saved. And we were in bondage spiritually with in no exception and with what? No expectation. You weren't going, you're not going to deliver yourself. You know, those men that fought, you know, in the, in the war of independence, they, you know, they freed themselves, didn't they? They did that. They took up arms. They went out in the cold. And they went out and they sacrificed and they left their families. They fought those battles. They freed themselves. But the spiritual bondage that we're in, you can't do that. You cannot free yourself from that. 
You're not going to do enough good works. You're not going to uh, go to church enough. You're not going to repent of enough sin. You're not going to get baptized enough. You're not going to keep enough sacraments. You're not going to you know, do whatever the church tells you in order to earn your way to heaven. You can't free from yourself from it. We were without hope in this world. That's what the Bible says right? in Ephesians 2. Look at verse 11. Wherefore, remember. That's what Paul was trying to do. Remember. That's what I'm trying to do tonight is to get you to remember the fact that we were in bondage. Before we get all excited about our, our, you know, our, spirit or our, our, our national identity and our national freedom, let's, let's get excited about our spiritual freedom, the, the, the one they can't take away. Wherefore, remember that ye being in, past, in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of the promise and having what? No hope and without God in the world. The Bible says that before you got saved, before God you know, revealed his son to you and you accepted Christ as Savior, that you had no hope in this world. It wasn't like, well, you know, if you, get, if you find out, if you, you know, if you hear the gospel and you get saved, you got to you know, you'll get saved, no, sure. But you know, on the off chance you don't, there's still this slim chance that maybe somehow you could find in another way. No, nope, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that without Christ, we are without hope. You know, they can go and fight their wars and they can liberate themselves, but they cannot liberate themselves spiritually. And what I'm trying to do is get you to remember that that is what has happened for you and me, that we've been liberated spiritually through Christ, meaning this, that we were at one time in bondage. We were at bondage, but Christ came and set us free. Now, through him, we are set at liberty. We didn't do that ourselves. He did that for us. He's the one that did all that work. Go over to, keep something in Ephesians chapter 2. Go over to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> the Bible says, I'll begin reading in verse 18. You know, we, we are set at liberty now. That's the good news. I'm not just here to remind you that you are on your hell, on way to hell today. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. <laughs> Guess, you know, you were all on your way to hell, and then Christ saved you. Amen. Okay? I also want to remind us the fact that we are set at liberty. You know, yeah, we were in bondage, but now today we're free in Christ. Christ has made us free. And that's, that's what they're celebrating today, the 4th of July. They're celebrating the fact that, they, that we are free. That we've made a, we are a free nation. Okay? But we spiritually are set at liberty. In Romans chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one many shall be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Satan kept sending his troops. God just sent more grace. He said, oh, I was, I was really bad. You know, I did a lot of bad things. Well, grace abounded. <clears throat> that sin, look at verse 20 and that sin that hath, hath reigned unto death even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord it says there that righteousness is reigning through Christ it has the, it, it, the, the preeminence it has dominion in your life once, once God set us free that's it we're, you know, we're, 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 set, at, we're at, set at liberty today through the righteousness that is in Christ go to Ephesians Chapter 2, back where you were, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, remember we were reading earlier how that we were without hope in the world, that we were strangers from the, from the covenant of the promises from God, of God. But now it says in verse 13, after we've been liberated, after we've been set free by Christ, but now in Christ Jesus, not by yourself, you didn't do that, he did it for you. Ye who are sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Talking about that partition between the Israelites and the Gentiles. Okay? Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law, the commandments. Remember, that's what we were under. We were under the law. We were subject to the law. We were subject to the elements of the world. And that it, he is the one that abolished in his flesh that enmity. Even the law of the commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself twain, uh, of twain one new man, so making peace 
and that he might reconcile both unto God in one by the body of the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Look at verse 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. We're set at liberty. We're not in bondage. We are fellow citizens, it goes on and says, with the saints and the household of God. Which one are you more excited about this morning or this evening? More excited about that I'm American? <clears throat> or are you more excited about the fact that, that Christ has made you an heir and a fellow citizen with the saints of the household of God? You know, that's the identity that I get excited about. That's the identity that I want to promote. You know, I, I don't want to get into this. And look, if people want to promote, you know, patriotism and nationalism, that's on them. I get excited about this. This is what I want to promote in this church, is the fact that we are uh, made nigh by the blood of Christ, okay? That we are no more strangers. That we are built, it says, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's what I'm built upon. That's my cornerstone. That's the bedrock of, of who I am. Jesus Christ. The commandments of the apostles and the prophets. That's what I get excited about. Those words. Not, you know, not the, 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 the declaration of independence. Look, I'm not against it. I'm glad, it's, I'm glad we have the Bill of Rights and all that. You know, we, we benefit from that. I'm not saying we should take that for granted. But they could take all that away. That can go away like that. <clears throat> and you know what? One day it will. <laughs> it's called the Antichrist. Okay? They're never going to take this away. They can destroy this flesh. They can burn down this building. And you know what? Send me right on up into, into heaven <clears throat> where I can be a fellow citizen, where I'm an heir. I'd like to see them take that away. We are set at liberty by Christ. We didn't do that. He did it for us. And not only that, we are still at liberty. You know, that's not something you have to worry about losing. Once you're set free in Christ, that's it. Then I, be, I should have kept some Romans. Go over to Romans chapter 8. Jesus said, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So I don't care what country you're in. I don't care if you're in communist China. I don't care if you're in whatever communist hellhole you want to point to where they don't have these liberties that we, you know, we have in this country. You know, if they're free in Christ, they are free indeed. Now, they might not, you know, they might have to suffer the consequences of living under a, you know, a wicked regime. But I think those people probably appreciate the fact, the freedom that they have in Christ even more than we would. You know, we kind of say, oh, yeah, it's cool. We're free in Christ. Yeah. You know, if that ever happened, we, we would have that. You know, there's some people, that's a reality for them. They say, wow, we, you know, we have to have church in secret. <laughs> we have to smuggle Bibles in here. You know, we have people that end up in jail. We never see them again. Because, you know, well, that's never happened. Oh, yes, it has. <laughs> you know, it's called the Soviet Union. <laughs> it's called Communist China. It's out there. Okay, that type of thing happens. <clears throat> Those are the people that are really appreciating the fact that they are free in Christ, that they have been set free indeed in Him. You know, hopefully, and I'm just trying to help us to do that tonight. You know, I want us to remember that, you know, we were in bondage spiritually and we've been set free by Christ and, and 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 again I don't think we should take our our civil liberties for granted but you know what maybe that's what we need sometimes sometimes I wonder maybe that's what this country needs to wake Christians up is to go through some kind of persecution and to wake up the people in this country who just think that you know life's just all about fun 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 and and doing whatever they want and and you know <coughs> You know, they'll give God a thought, you know, twice a year on Easter and Christmas. And that's about all he gets. You know, the people that are living in these, you know, communist hellholes, you know, that are Christians that are saved, I guarantee you God's on their mind quite a bit. That they are thinking, they're reading John 8, 36 and saying, Amen. If the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. He said in John 5, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Look, once Christ set us at liberty and he broke those shackles and broke the bondage of sin 
and set us free from the law and the elements of the world, it's, it's done. It's over. It's permanent. It always makes me think of that hymn. I can't remember the song, but it says, it talks about how, uh, you know, the, the dungeon filled with light, my chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Something of that. I'm probably butchering it. <coughs> it always makes me think about that. When I talk, hear about you know, Jesus talking about being set at freedom, at, at liberty, being made free in Christ, having passed from death unto life. And I always think about that picture of a, a Christian you know, who, who continues to live in sin. You know, and and it, it reminds me of them. You know, they're, like a, they're like a prisoner. Where someone, you know, Christ shows up, spiritually speaking, and he throws the prison door open. And the shackles fell off, and he sets them free and says, hey, the prison's door, we can go. And they say, no, I want to stay right here. <laughs> and they start to hold that shackle on. You know, that's their sin. So I just want to stay here, and I'm real used to this chain. You know, you know I've spent a lot of time in this cell, in this sin, with this, with this particular sin, this chain, and, you know, I just, I, I don't want to leave it behind. And they hold that shackle on. And, they, you know, as soon as they let it go, it just falls off again. Whoops, <laughs> we put that back on. People might live that way. Christians might live that way in their life. But the fact is, is that shackle is loose. That, that prison door is open. And it's up to them to just start walking and following Christ, and he'll lead them right out of that dungeon of sin. They are set free. We are set at liberty. Once we're set at liberty, we're always at liberty. We've passed from death into life. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's a, now there's a comma there, not a period. Okay. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Meaning this, you know, there is no condemnation if you walk in the Spirit. But there is condemnation if you walk after the flesh. <clears throat> now I'm not talking about damnation. I'm talking about condemnation. You know, you're still going to be saved. You're going to go to heaven no matter what. But you can still be judged in this life. Because that's, that's what we get accused of all the time, isn't it? Oh, you're saying people can live however they want and still go to heaven. Yep, that's what I'm saying. In part, what, you know, what, what I'm really saying is this, is that people can live however they want and suffer sin's consequences on their way to heaven. That's what he's saying. There is no condemnation in them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh. There's no condemnation to those who walk after Christ Jesus. To, to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk, walk out after the flesh. There is none. Okay. It, but those that do walk in the flesh, who don't walk in the Spirit, there is some condemnation. There's just not going to hell. Okay. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Going back to that picture, you know, drop that chain. You know, leave that prison behind. You're not indebted. You don't have to stay there. We're not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. What is he saying? You mortify those deeds. You, you walk in the new man. You walk in the Spirit. There's no condemnation. You'll live. You'll, there'll be God's blessing. Verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You know, God hasn't shackled us with a new shackle. God set us free. We're not, we're not being, you know, bound again. Ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Sound familiar? Going back to Galatians. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs of, with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. So what, what am I saying? Was we're set at liberty. It's permanent. We can still suffer the consequences, right? <clears throat> he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. You know, we have the option of serving two different, wh whoever we want. Look, before, there was no other choice. There was sin, and that's it. That's the only option you had. Serve Satan, serve sin, serve the flesh, and go to hell. That was it. That was our only option. But now we have the option of, you know, we're going to go to heaven. We're heirs, we know, but we still could go serve sin, couldn't we? I mean, Christians do it all the time. Get backslidden, get out of church, quit on God. And go serve the flesh. Happens all the time. 
And whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. That's why he said, if I, did you keep anything in Galatians? I'll just read to you from Galatians. He said in chapter 5, verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, in Galatians, obviously, he's talking about the fact that you know, Judaizers were kind of coming in and trying to bring them under the bondage of circumcision, teaching that they needed to still be circumcised. And Paul's saying, no, <laughs> you don't. That's bondage. That's, don't be entangled with those things again. But, you know, we can make the application tonight that, you know, God, Christ has set you free, has given you the spirit of his son, the spirit of God dwelling in you, whereby you cry, Abba, Father, and if you really wanted to, you could have victory over those sins in your life. Now, I'm not saying we're going to live a perfect, sinless life. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But we can, through Christ, have victory over sin. That we can be, even, you know, we are set at liberty. If the if Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I'm not just, you know, not just, oh, when I get to heaven, then everything will be better. I'll, of course it'll be better. Then I can quit sinning. No, you can, you know, you can stop those sins now. I'm not saying you can quit sinning completely, obviously. Don't misunderstand me. But there's the fact is that some people have sins in their life that they just hang on to for no good reason. It's just their pet sin. And if they wanted to, they could let it go. You know, they could, they could leave it behind. <coughs> That's what I'm saying. That's, and what, how are you going to do that? By standing fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. That's what I'm trying to get across tonight. That's what I'm trying to hope that we can appreciate, the fact that we were in bondage. We've been set free by Christ. And if that's the case, then you know, we might as well live like it. And don't be t people that take your, you know, your spiritual liberties for granted. You know, people might take their civil liberties for granted and things like that. You know, and that's, you know, that's, that's too bad. But you know what's a real shame? Is when Christians take their spiritual liberty for granted. That's the real shame. You know, maybe they might fully appreciate everything that they have in this country but you know what's even worse than that is when they don't appreciate everything that Christ has done for them. And they, when they know that there's some sin they should get rid of and they just don't do it. Or they know there's something, you know, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not as sin. It's not just the bad things we do, it's the good things we don't do. So I know I should start doing whatever. But, you know, I just don't feel like it. Well, that's a shame. You know, you need to learn to stand fast in liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. <coughs> Go over to Romans chapter 12. This ain't going to be a long sermon. I know I'm trying to preach until it gets dark, but you know, I know Paul would preach till midnight in the book of Acts, but it'll be plenty dark here in a bit. All right? The long sermon was this morning. I'll give you a break. Now it'll be 30 minutes from now. <laughs> the Bible says in 2 Peter, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he had brought in bondage. You know, if, we're, if we let sin rule over us, you know, that's who we serve. You know, if we serve sin, we're, 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 we're the servant of sin. He said, did I have you go to Romans 6, 12? Jump back to Romans 6. You're right there. Romans chapter 6. I want to draw attention to verse 12 where it says that first word, let not sin, therefore reign in your mortal bodies. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. You know, we have a lot of ability, a lot of power in Christ to not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. Oh, I just can't help it. Yes, you can. That's what the Bible says. That's why it says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. That's a commandment. That you should obey it in the lust thereof. Now, it, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I'm saying it's possible. Through Christ. That's the liberty that we have in Christ. That's the freedom that we have in Christ. That we can even have victory over sins in our life. Let not sin. Because we always say, well, I know one day I'm going to be free in Christ. You can never take that away from me. I'll be in heaven. It'll be glorious, wonderful. And we know that. But you know what? Don't take for granted the fact that you can have victory over sin in your life right now. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you shall obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. That's what he's saying. You know, God, is, I mean, when you think about it, that's a perfect picture. Those that are alive from the dead. 
you know, we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were on our way to hell and Christ revived us and he put his spirit in us and saved us. Literally, you know, brought us back from the dead in the spiritual sense, right? And that's what you are as a saved, born again believer. Somebody who's been brought back from the dead and has been given the spirit of God. And he's saying, because of that, because you have been brought back from the dead, yield yourselves unto God. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. No man can serve two masters. You know, we need to learn to pick righteousness. We need to learn to pick Christ. We need to learn to not yield to sin, but what? Yield unto God. <clears throat> yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You know, I think that's probably the, sometimes the struggle that Christians have is that they just look at their members that, you know, where so much sin comes from, the lusts of the flesh, and they just say, you know, I, 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 rather than looking at, they just look at it like some loathsome thing that, that they have to drag around until they get to heaven. I just got to drag, I'm just stuck in this, you know, this carcass that's just full of sin and iniquity that just has all these lusts. You know, and it's just this constant battle. And, and it is. I know that. But you know what? Maybe we need to learn to understand that it, it's, not just, it's not just the fact that our members need to be crucified. We need to mortify the members. But maybe we need to learn to what? To look at them as instruments of righteousness. If you start to look at this, this body, this temple, as the Bible calls it, your body is the temple of God. If you looked at it as an instrument of righteousness, you know, it might be a little bit easier to get some space between you and those sins. It might be easier for you to, to put those things away and have the victory in Christ if you, what, if you saw your body not as just some source of iniquity, but what a, an instrument of righteousness. Is that what he said there? Did I, I mean, I read that right. Didn't you yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members, talking about your body, you know, your members, as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now, I look at mine and I go, <laughs> an instrument of righteousness? <laughs> That's what the Bible says. An instrument of righteousness. Not in its glory, not in its beauty, but what? In its ability to what it can accomplish for God. You know, where these, these feet might have gone some places that they never should have been, but now they can go to places where God would want them. You know, these hands might have done things that, that I would be ashamed to even speak of. But now they can go out and do what? Open up a Bible, knock a door, hand out an invite, write a sermon, fold in prayer, shake a hand. You know, these, these, in, these are, your body is an instrument of righteousness. That is the liberty that you have in Christ. That is the freedom that has been given us. Don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. Go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, it says in a very familiar passage, probably people in here have it memorized. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He says that's reasonable. Oh, man, cruci mortify the, the, the flesh. Turn this body on an instrument of righteousness. That's kind of a big, that's kind of a tall order, God. It's kind of a big ask. The Bible says that's your reasonable service. That's not God asking too much at all. <clears throat> he said that you may present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed this trans this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable, perfect will of God. <clears throat> he says that's your reasonable service. Why? Why is that so reasonable? Because of the fact that, you know, we have been set at liberty. We will remain at liberty. You know, even if we decide to, to, to serve sin, you know, ultimately we're headed for heaven. Okay? Why is that your reasonable service? To use your bodies as instruments of righteousness, to yield them as a living sacrifice. Why is that reasonable? Because of the fact that you are indebted. Why should I do it? Why should I do that? Why should I live for the Lord? Just because the Bible says so? Because you owe it. Because <laughs> you're indebted. You owe that. He said, that's your reasonable service. Not so you can go to heaven. Because God owns you. He owns us. He bought us. He redeemed us. 
I mean, if you went and bought something at the store and then somebody else walked up and said, no, that's mine, you'd say, well, here's the receipt. I paid for this. This is mine. Well, no, that's mine. I'm going to do whatever I want with it. You know, good luck. You know, if something, you know I'm not going to just let that go. You know, God feels the same way about us. God looks down at us and says, what are you doing with my body? What are you doing with the members that I purchased? What are you doing with the mind and the tongue and the eyes and the ears that I redeemed? What are you doing with that life that I own? Is what God is saying. We are indebted. We're going to close here soon. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Yes, we're free in Christ. It's a great feeling to, to know that no matter what happens in this world, war, famine, coronavirus, you know, whatever they censor, whatever they take away, they can't touch the liberty that I have in Christ. They can't touch the inheritance that has been given me. I'm an heir. You can't take that away from me. You know, and, and hopefully we're learning to appreciate that. You know, and hopefully we don't have to go you know, through some great tribulation before we'll learn to appreciate that. <clears throat> That's great, isn't it, to know that you have that, that you are free in Christ, that you're free indeed. But what we also need to understand is that we're indebted because of it. We're indebted. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Verse 19. Well, I mean, who are you to tell me what I can and can't do with my body? What do you mean I can't commit fornication? What do you mean I can't be a drunk or whatever? What do you mean I can't commit whatever sin I want in my body? Well, Paul says, what? Verse 19. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? I mean, those words just need to ring in our ears sometimes. When we're tempted to do some sin, when we're tempted to do something we know we shouldn't do or slack on doing something we know we should do, let those, those just ring in our ears. Ye are not your own. If it weren't a sin, I'd say tattoo it on your forehead. <laughs> Make sure you do it backwards so you can check it out in the mirror. <laughs> but those should just, you know, those should be written on the, on the fleshy tables of our heart. You know, those should be in our mind. The fact that we are not our own. And when the Bible commands us to do something, we should just say, yes, Lord, that's what I'll do. Because you redeemed me. Why? Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Bible says we are bought with a price. You know, our liberty, our freedom did not, you know, I know it's cliche, but I'm going to say it, freedom isn't free. Now, peop most people want to use that saying and say, well, yeah, you, you know, respect the military. And, you know, that's another sermon. <laughs> but, you know, there's some truth to that spiritually, too. The freedom that we have in Christ wasn't free. We were bought. Oh, I love the fact that I'm free in Christ, that I'm heaven bound, that I'm saved, that I have victory over sin in the grave, that I'm no longer, you know, in bondage through the fear of death all the days of my life. I'm so glad for that. Okay, that's great. But understand this. That came at a price. You didn't pay anything for it. You didn't have to do anything for it. But somebody did. And we know who that is. That's Christ. He was the one that paid that price, right? A price was paid. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll close there. We all know these passages, but I'm just trying to remind us again. This is a day of remembrance for a lot of people, isn't it? A lot of people are, are contemplating and thinking about the past, trying to, you know, not everybody, obviously, but people are trying to, you know, recall certain things so they can appreciate the freedom that they have in this country. You know, and rather than just trying to promote that, you know, I want to help us to, in that same vein, remind us and cause us to be, you know, appreciative of the fact that we are free in Christ and that a price was paid for that freedom in Christ. That's because that's the real liberty that we should get excited about, the one that they cannot be taken away. The Bible says in Galatians 3, you're going to 1 Peter 1, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. You know, there was a price to be paid. He redeemed us, and that's great, isn't it? And we, we love that. He has redeemed us from the curse of the law. But sometimes we kind of forget about that last little bit of that phrase, being made a curse for us. 
<coughs> he became sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. For it is cursed, written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. You know, that was the price that was paid. Christ came and laid down his life for us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass your time of the, the time of your sojourning here in fear. Not fear of death, not fear of sin and its consequences, but what? The fear of God. Be afraid of God, the one who's redeemed you. Pass the time you are sojourning in fear, for as much as ye know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received from, by tradition from your fathers. You didn't buy your way out of this. Sorry, Catholic Church. <laughs> you, know, you didn't pay enough penance. You didn't, you know, uh, no one's going to get you out of purgatory by paying a bunch of money. You didn't do that. You know, Christ is the one that paid that price. You're not redeemed by your vain conversations, but with the precious blood of Christ. That's the price that was paid. That's the, that's the blood that I get excited about. That's, you know, we want to get excited about the red, white, and blue. Well, that, that's the red I get excited about, is the blood of Christ. <laughs> because you can't make that stand for anything else other than for Christ. <clears throat> The precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you. Man, why did he come here? For you. To redeem us. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Look, my faith and my hope is not in this country. It's not in the Bill of Rights. It's not in the Constitution. It's not in some senator or some president. <clears throat> it's not in any of those things. My faith and hope is in God. Because he's the one that has brought me the only real and true hope that there is in this world. Through Christ. And I hope that we'll learn to appreciate that. That maybe this evening we can walk out of here, you know, rather than being so super excited about something that happened hundreds of years ago, you know, <laughs> It seems like a distant memory. Rather than be excited about, you know, the 4th of July, let's get excited about the fact that a price was paid for us that brought us real liberty. A real liberty that cannot be taken away from us. Let's get excited about the fact not that we're free in America. And I'm not saying take it for granted. Appreciate it. Use it. Put it to work. You know, take advantage of the opportunity that we have. Spread the message. Shout it from the housetops. Let people know. You know, publish it abroad. You know, use the freedom of speech as much as we're able as they start to tighten that noose. Use the freedom of religion. Do all that. But let's not get excited about the freedom in America more than we are what? The, let's not be more excited about that more than what we're f that the fact that we're free in Christ. That's what I want to get excited about. That's what I want you to be excited about is the fact that Christ has made us free. You know when we'll, when we'll get excited about the fact that Christ has made us free? When we understand that we were in bondage, that we were without hope, and that a price was paid, and Christ is the one that paid it, that was, his blood was shed. Then maybe we'll get excited about the fact that we're free in Christ. Let's go ahead and pray.